everybody to join the session. I think we have a great uh, uh, topic uh, this afternoon, and also we have a great uh, moderator here. Uh, Toyo Hash, Toshia Muramasa um, will be a chair with me, with my good friends. And also we have a great uh, panelist here, uh, including uh, Dr. Chen, Andy from uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Eric Hong from Vietnam, and uh, uh, Shimano Kuki and from Thailand, and also Kashima from Japan, Kim, uh, Dr. Kim from uh, uh, Korea, Lam from Malaysia, and also the goods and those are our good friends uh, from uh, Indonesia. So uh, we uh, have uh, four talks, probably the first talk I would like to invite the first talk, Dr. Ain from Asa Medical Center to give us the first talk, Difficult Wilding Tips and Tricks. Uh, please, Dr. Ain. Thank you very much for very kind introduction. The, my topic is difficult to wire in tips and tricks. I am Dr. Chong Minan from Asa Medical Centers. Initially, there is no coronary wire, but uh, John, John Simpson developed the, the coronary wire over the wire balloon system, so we can we could do the uh, uh, PCI to the far from the proxy uh, LAD or proxy complex. This is a purpose of a wire. I think the wiring is alpha and omega uh, to reach the far end of a vessel to rail the device into the coronaries to access the lesion, to cross the lesion atraumatically to provide the support for the interventional device and the FFR measurement. Actually, the coronary wire and wiring technique has advanced uh, through the CTO, CTO technique. So, but uh, I don't, Cover the CTO wiring technique in my top in my topics. I think the work course wire is very important. There are many work course wires: nitro based, composite core, dual core, stainless steel. I still favor the old friend BMW wire because uh, this is a traumatic and ability to retain tip configuration. However, classified legion, tortuous long legion, the uh, this BMW wire has a limitation to so. We have to know the characteristic of workhorse wire, so uh, so the, you can uh, familiar with the one workhorse wire can apply to the other uh, uh, workhorse wires. Uh, tip shaving is very important for the large vessel. Large uh, for large vessel, large coverage necessary. Smaller vessel and smaller coverage necessary. So in addition, the best view is very important. To, the wiring technique itself, uh, I think the best view is more important than the wiring technique itself. To, uh, to cross the circumflex, or circumflex in this kind of case, so to uh, the best view selection is very important. I, I, I like to select it, the spider view rather than the caudal view because the spider view uh, show the better uh, better visualize the circumflex osteo. So selection of best view is very important. In addition, guiding, guiding manipulation is another important uh, factors. Uh, when you use when you use the jerking guiding catheter left turn, you, if you want to go through the LAD, you have to engage the uh, guiding catheter into LAD, then you, uh, you, you can go to the LAD easily. Uh, but uh, for the circumflex, you have to disengage a little. Uh, uh, it, it makes uh, more coaxial to the circumflex. So the, if you want to go to somewhere, you have, you have to do manipulate the guiding catheter as well. In addition, stable wire position is very important. I inserted uh, the wire to the circumflex, but the tip is not stable. So the looping tip is very, uh, makes the uh, very stable wiring position and very safe. Look at the, this is uh, the run through wire. It goes through the outside of the stand. So the, it makes a preparation. So the, fortunately we, we, we did the successful embolization by gel foam patient is okay but uh, to avoid the uh, perforation, such like uh, this kind of complication, uh, you have to 
uh, making the looping tip it would be a very important. Yes, this is a very tortuous uh, vessel. So wiring itself is not easy. So in this case, uh, supporting guiding catheter supporting is very important. So sometimes guiding catheter supporting is not enough. So a total catheter may help for, for this uh, wiring in this kind of very tortuous vessel. So the successfully I impl implanted the stem. Sometimes body wire is uh, very useful for strong backup. So the one is the cause of failure to cross the lesion, the highly stereotyped classified lesion, suboptimal guide wire tip, tortuosity, poor support. How to uh, resolve this issue? The change in tip shape, different guide wire, microdetter would be the solution. Sometimes wiring to the circumflex, very, very difficult. The more than 180 degree, so wiring, to the circum circumplex is very difficult. So there are some solutions, large band or angulated microcatheters or reversed wires. Sometimes deflation volume may help. I like to introduce the reverse wire technique like this, make a band, long band using the dual lumen microcatheters and push it to the distal and slowly pull back, uh, and you can go into the reverse angle, the side branch like this. This is a very useful technique for the very angulated bifurcation. Yes, yeah, sub, sub, uh, sub total lesion, sometimes we have to, to be cautious for the wiring because uh, look at we, I, wire, I wired to the diagonal branch and LAD. So sometimes diagonal branch go through the plug. In this kind of case, if you put the stand crossover, 100% side branch will jail it. So for this region, you have to be careful. Another situation, I, simple, I did a simple crossover stenting without side branch jailed wire, no yeah, side branch gone. So I think jailed wire technique for simple, uh, for simple crossover stenting is very important. So first important message is don't make a complicated situation. Please insert the wire to the side, uh, bifurcation side branch. In addition, if you learn the CTO technique, CTO wire, if you, if you learn the CTO wire characteristics technique, then sometimes you can easily overcome the very difficult wiring situation. So I think the CTO technique may help for the situation with the difficult wiring. This is uh, the case of side branch rewiring in two stand technique. This is wire. Wire is very easily go through the circumflex. So the four two stand technique side branch rewiring. I like to say that for uh, make a preconditioning for easy rewiring. What is the precondition? The first high pressure circumflex osteum stand before crushing and main branch stand optimization. Two step would be very important for easy rewiring. Two step uh, makes the side branch hole bigger, so uh, it facilitated to easily uh, to rewire to the circumflex. Uh, this is my summary. In the difficult situation for wiring, imagination and smart choice for strategy and device are more important than manual technique itself. Please do not make a complex situation. Please make a precondition for easy wiring. Learning CTO technique may be helpful in situation for difficult rewiring. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Because a uh, little bit uh, over time, uh, we are uh, preparing the, on the panel discussion as a final. So the second talk, 
uh, just reminding because uh, we have only 10 minutes for each talk. Uh, James from USA, uh, for the second talk, the topic will be pre-lesion modification, why and how. Uh, James, please. So I'm gonna talk about uh, pre-lesion modification, nothing to disclose. And why do we modify lesions before stenting? Well, the number one reason is to deliver a stent and to expand the stent, reduce restenosis and thrombosis, and also to optimize the efficacy of PCI. In the beginning, the stents were hand crimped and they, they can fall off and go embolized distal and some other limb. Um, but now we've got very thin strut, flexible stents. We've got nice new sophisticated supportive wires. Here's an example of a lesion untreatable 10, 15 years ago, but now with tools like guide extension catheters, stent delivery has gotten much easier. I'm gonna show a couple of cases of the importance of lesion modification. An 87 year old woman with unstable angina, severe calcified lesion in the distal vein into the LAD. Here's a stent that looks like it's expanding okay. There's a post dilation balloon, looks to be well expanded. And on this view, it looks like a nice angiographic result. Uh, on this view, it's a little harder to lay out. So what do you do? Well, you really need to do intravascular imaging to understand how good a result is because the angiography can be misleading. And you see there, if it whizzed past it, he had a very eccentric, underexpanded stent in that one focal area. Here's another case, 68 year old man, refractory angina, very tight mid LD lesion, moderately calcified, pre dilated, stent easily goes in, a long stent here. And then attempt to post till, you see that dog boning there, very severe lesion, did not expand. Here's an angiogram, mid stent, very tight stenosis remaining. I'll get back to this case in a little bit. So what's the data on pre-preparation pre, uh, of lesions? Not much, but it's, it, it's out there. It starts in the old angiography era where larger lumens led to less pre-stenosis. And then with the introduction of intravascular ultrasound, um, IVUS, IVUS use led to, to less restenosis. This is the AVID trial that looked at use of IVUS after a apparently optimal angiographic result, and it led to more balloon dilation, larger sizes, better luminal gain, and in some, in almost all, in all the sizes, there was numerical less TLR at 12 months. Then came drug limiting stents, and perhaps people thought that all this. Uh, Worry was over. Well, it wasn't really. Here's a re analysis on restenosis and showed that in 42% of cases in this series, there was a stent under expansion, not just neal and hyperplasia, but also under expansion. And also in this analysis, uh, stent thrombosis of drug loading stents was associated with less stent expansion or under expansion of stents. Here are some other evidence that's uh, interesting in terms of the importance of lesion preparation. The defined PCI trial, 24% of subjects had abnormal IFR after PCI, and the vast majority of this was done to angiographically inapparent focal stenosis, suggesting suboptimal lesion prep. Here's a study using OCT, not just uh, using IVUS, but OCT is an excellent imaging tool. Uh, and in this study, it demonstrated stent failure and restenting that had under expansion was associated with worse clinical outcomes. What about uh, bioabsorbital vascular scaffolds? Well, we learned that post procedural luminal diameter was a major predictor of late BVS scaffold thrombosis and that a dedicated strategy to prep lesions reduce this risk. And finally, here's a sub-study of the Excel left main PCI trial 
And in, in this analysis, they showed that very complex lesions, when prepped appropriately with tools like atherectomy and cutting scoria balloons, he had similar clinical outcomes uh, as patients with very simple lesions. So not a lot of evidence, but all the evidence points to the value of lesion preparation. Now, the old toolbox was pretty simple. Non-compliant balloons, directional atherectomy, which is extinct now, uh, rotational atherectomy, and first-generation cutting balloons. Getting back to that second case, this is an IVL or, or lithotripsy balloon into that focal area of stent under expansion, then a high-pressure NC balloon, and the problem was solved. We have a lot, lot more tools in recent years, orbital atherectomy, intravascular lithotripsy, newer generation cutting and scoring balloons, laser has a role. Uh, there are now ultra high pressure balloons that can go up to, they're double layered and go up to 40 atmospheres without causing a rupture. And what's coming next might be bioadaptable DES where the vessel may expand sometime after um, the stents are placed. However, what's crucial to, modif to uh, monitoring lesion prep is intravascular imaging, whether it be IVUS or OCT, here both showing calcium in a different but, but similar fashion. Uh, and also the use of physiological testing like IFR and FFR to understand if ischemia was properly resolved uh, with proper lesion prep and stent expansion. Here's the third case, 74 year old with unstable angina, diffuse disease, tight calcified distal lesion. So the decision was made to do orbital atherectomy. There's the burr there. Then a NC balloon was taken and maybe hard to see, but just wouldn't expand. Well, Iva showed that there's still significant 360 degree calcium. So what do you do next? Well, this is a case of combined treatment with a intravascular lithotripsy balloon here. And then after treatment of that in several parts of the vessel and the use of a mother and child catheter, stenting became quite easy. And here you see a final result. So sometimes you have to use these tools together when you're doing adequate lesion preparation. So on the how side, uh, predilation is the default strategy. There may be a limited role for direct stenting, but you can get burn with direct stenting. There should be a low threshold for intravascular imaging, whether it be IVIS or OCT. There's plenty of appropriate devices to deal with calcium and resistant lesions uh, to modify plaque. There should be a low threshold for post stent imaging. If you've done it pre, you already have it ready to go to really understand uh, if you've optimized your result. High pressure post dilation with non compliant balloons when needed, and a proper final assessment. Sometimes that final assessment can include physiological measuring. So, in conclusion, pre dilation remains critically important, especially in the era of thin strut, easily deliverable DES. Full stent expansion has been correlated with reduced risk of pre stenosis and stent thrombosis. There's now a variety of tools to address calcified and resistant lesions. Dr. Curtain will go into this more detail in the next lecture. An intravascular imaging with either IVERS or OCT is really essential to optimize predilation and stent expansion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the uh, wonderful talk. And I'm giving the next two talks uh, to the chair, to um, Ramat, my good friends, to introduce uh, the speakers. Okay, and thank you for all my uh, sessions. And uh, I introduce the third speaker, Dr. Ketun from the Columbia University. And title is uh, uh, Break on Rocks, the selection of device uh, for the classified disease. Ketun, please. Hi, my name is Ajay Kirthne from Columbia University Medical Center, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today virtually, of course. Um, I wish I could be there in person um, to be able to talk to you about the selection of devices for calcified coronary artery disease. 
Here are my disclosures, a variety of sources to Columbia University and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation uh, for research grants primarily. I'll start off with an illustrative case because I think this really shows us where we are today in the uh, era of more and more calcified lesions. This is a patient who presented with progressive angina, had risk factors uh, for coronary artery disease, and actually had stents deployed in the proximal to mid LAD with noted under expansion at that time. Um, the operator at that time just elected to leave the stents as is, but the patient continued to have worsening symptoms and the patient returned back to the cath lab. A, uh, another operator actually performed rotational atherectomy with stent ablation to try to ablate the stent and the calcium behind it uh, with then angioplasty alone, but was still unable to ex expand the stent and the patient continued to have symptoms. She then returned back a third time, and this is what she had in her proximal LED. And you can see it's unfortunate because the remainder of the vessels appear to be um, quite large and unobstructed, but in that proximal LED segment, an IVUS catheter won't even cross because of how underexpanded the stents are with residual calcium um, that's there. This has already been ablated with rotablation. Um, we then tried to cross with a 2O balloon that wouldn't cross. And finally, a 125 balloon and then a 15 balloon was able to cross and make a little bit of room. Unfortunately, with NC balloons, we were unable to expand this area despite going up to 30 atmospheres with different um, companies' balloons. And you can see the remarkable waste there in the proximal LED. And I'll remind you, this had already been rotobladed um, in the past. And so at that point, with the inability to advance the 3O balloon past the LED stent, uh, we opted to proceed with laser atherectomy. And with contrast, this is what we got, um, demonstrating that um, the calcium had cracked and were able to actually expand the prior stents that were there. So the final result that is shown here shows good expansion and the patient has done well since then. The question is, is this, this case more broadly generalizable or is this just an extreme case that I've shown? And my uh, supposition here is actually the answer is yes. And the reason for that is that our stents more and more are so thin or strutted and so deliverable that they get to places that old stents wouldn't get. And if one does not recognize severely calcified disease, even fibrotic disease, and simply delivers the stent, gets the stent to where it needs to go and expands it, but then doesn't fully expand, you'll be left with this scenario. And this is just another case, an example with further uh, intravascular imaging of a patient who presented with recurrent instant restenosis, even after post dilatation, you can see a waste. And this is what you see um, on OCT imaging, where you see that the vessel is much, much larger, but there's concentric calcification. The stent um, is, has some neointimal hyperplasia, but is also severely constrained. The problem is that many operators see this and they see neointimal hyperplasia and instant restenosis, and they put another stent in, making the situation that much worse for even treatment subsequent to that point. So the question is, why does this happen? And I think the reason is, is that many um, operators are just not attuned to the fact that there could be coronary calcification in vessels. These are the approval studies for various DES, and in these studies, severe calcification was an exclusion in most of the studies. And yet, almost three out of 10 patients in these studies had severe calcification as adjudicated by the core lab. These are supposed to be simple lesions. What if we get to the real world of more complex lesions as shown in the syntax trial here, almost half patients have heavy calcification. And these are patients of, of course, multivessel and left main disease referred for either PCI or cabbage. But these are the types of patients we're seeing more and more these days, which is why we need to be attuned to the presence of coronary calcification and the devices that we can use to modify that calcification so as to be able to get a better outcome. Now, why do we have to do that? The reason is, is twofold. One, I think people understand that when you have coronary calcification, the cases get longer, they become more complicated. You can't deliver your stents as easily. You can't expand your stents. You also get asymmetry. People also understand that there's increased procedural complications, such as dissections and perforations. But I don't think it's easily as recognized that coronary calcification increases the rates of stent thrombosis and also restenosis. Longer term outcomes are worse with coronary calcification. Now, the reason for this is it's not just about getting your stent to where it needs to get. You have to be able to expand the stent to get a lumen so that you can get adequate flow in the vessel and that flow stays that way over time. And this is just a sort of famous slide showing that the more arc of calcification you get, the less likely you are to be able to expand your stent and the more likely you are to be able to need to use something like rotational atherectomy or other devices to modify the plaque. Now, what about the longer term outcomes of coronary calcification? 
This is an instructive slide because it shows that the long-term rates of adverse events in severely calcified lesions, even with conventional second-generation drug eluting stents, is remarkably high at 16.4% rate of target vessel failure. That's among the highest risk lesions that we treat in the current day and age with drug eluting stents. And it's not just target lesion revascularization that's increased, but also stent thrombosis goes up as well, presumably because the stent is underexpanded and there's not enough uh, flow uh, through the vessel as a result of that. So bad outcomes certainly occurring because of coronary calcification. So how can we treat these calcified lesions? Well, the right answer is most certainly not direct stenting because you need to modify the plaque first. But there are a variety of strategies to modify plaque. You can take NC balloons. You don't want to take compliant balloons because of the differential expansion that you would get with potential risk of perforation. But NC balloons, um, super high pressure NC balloons, cutting balloons, angiosculps, um, uh, laser, rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, and lithotripsy, a variety of options are, that are out there to treat coronary calcifications. Now, how should we choose our, these, tech, uh, these different technologies and techniques? And so we'll come to that in a second, but I think one fundamental premise that's needed to be understood when we're talking about coronary calcification is the ability to create a calcium fracture and how that impacts your stent area after um, you put a stent in. The reason for that is if you have concentric calcification and you expand a stent in that concentric calcification, unless you've released the wall, you're not going to expand that stent because you have to form a fracture. And that's shown nicely in these OCT images. And frankly, I think many of um, these observations were facilitated by the use of intravascular imaging, such as OT OCT, whereas here you see a fracture plane and then the stent is able to expand. Now, if you have eccentric calcification, you may get good expansion against the opposite wall where the calcification is. Sometimes you can ablate the calcium with atherectomy and then make there be more room. But this issue of fracture really, really counts more when you have larger arcs of calcification, more concentric calcification as a whole. And that leads to greater MSAs after you fracture it and less restenosis and target lesion revascularization. Now, how can you predict that you're going to get a fracture with conventional techniques like balloons? Well, this is a scoring system um, that uh, we did uh, in collaboration with St. Francis and the CRF Core Lab, where basically um, you can see that the greater the angle of calcification, 180 or more, the thicker the calcium, 0.5 millimeters or more, or a length of five millimeters or more, all of those contribute to an inability to crack the calcium, an inability to expand your stent, and the more likely um, knowledge that you're going to need to use an adjunctive plaque modifying technology in order to achieve a maximal stent expansion. Similar systems with OCT have also um, uh, been demonstrated. Uh, sorry, with IVIS have been demonstrated. This is actually um, largely based upon OCT. Now, the treatment of calcified lesions, though, and how these findings impact what you do, actually don't really have high levels of evidence in the guidelines. The highest level of evidence is sort of a 2A recommendation for rotational atherectomy, but nothing else carries a class one guideline. And that's why for a lot of people, what you choose is based upon what you're familiar with, but that's not really how we ought to be treating patients. We ought to come up with algorithms to determine what the best modality is for the patient and be familiar with all the modalities so as to achieve the best outcomes. Now, simplified strategies have been shown here, and this is prior to intravascular uh, lithotripsy, where basically you look at the calcification. If it's mild, you can go to a non-plaque um, modifying strategy. If it's severe, you go to a plaque modifying strategy like atherectomy at that time. And if it's moderate, you use imaging to arbitrate whether it's severe or not. And if it is, then you go to a plaque modifying strategy. Subsequent to the, um, the development of, of lithotripsy, you have more complicated algorithms that essentially are very similar in the sense that can you get a fracture with a conventional technique? And if you can't, then we need to use a plaque modifying strategy. If the vessel is difficult to cross, you typically have to use atherectomy. And if it's easier to cross, it potentially could favor something like further NC balloons and or lithotripsy. And so there are a variety of ways. This is a complex algorithm published in Jack in 2019. So going through the specifics in terms of the different devices that are out there and their mechanisms of action and how what the data is in favor of them. Um, this is just an example of what happens with uh, lithotripsy where because you have um, a, a shock wave that advances from this balloon-based technology, you can get calcium fractures. And then when your stent is deployed, 
it actually expands in the vessel because the vessel is actually fractured. Now, overall, the rates of success when this device can be delivered are quite high. The rates of complications are quite low. This is a pooled analysis of the Disrupt CAD studies just published this year, showing that um, despite 97% severe calcification, um, the success was almost 99% of cases. Of note, though, predilatation was used in almost half the cases, and the diameter stenosis was not that severe. In other words, these lesions could be crossed and the device could successfully be delivered. But nonetheless, these were um, uh, very good outcomes and certainly showing that there is not much of a learning curve to this device, provided you're familiar with complex PCI techniques, such as the use of guide extensions, aggressive predilatation, good guide support, et cetera. Now, what about coronary atherectomy? Um, we know that uh, atherectomy is on the rise overall because coronary calcification is on the rise overall. But here in the United States, among hospitals that do PCI, only a third, uh, or actually only two thirds performed atherectomy and a fully a third or more performed no atherectomy at all. Um, Overall rates of atherectomy were well under 4%, um, both for rotational and orbital atherectomy. And so there's a clear gap here, and some of this relates to familiarity, some of it relates to training, some of it relates to backup. Now, in more um, enriched populations, such as, for instance, in the Veterans Administration, there's here in the United States, more smoking, um, more peripheral vascular disease, more risk factors, you can see that atherectomy can be used in up to almost 20% of cases. And actually, the use of atherectomy in this observational study was associated with a decrease in complications, presumably because it made cases easier. And this comes to the phenomenon of if you're thinking about using it, oftentimes you do want to use it because if you try other methods, you're going to be in for a long, long day in that regard. Now, the traditional system for atherectomy has been the uh, rotoblader system. It's now been upgraded with the RotoPro system where there's no foot pedal and everything is controlled um, by this hand controller. Now, this issue of roto regret or the, the challenge of just doing it provisionally if balloons fail is shown nicely in this slide from Italy where basically if you do that, the provisional rotational atherectomy, you have longer procedure times, contrast, fluoro, just more pain associated with it. And so that's one of the reasons why it's important to make the diagnosis up front, use a device up front so as to make your case easier, and that's irrespective of the specific device. Now, what about the data in terms of randomized data with rotoblader? The Rotaxa study was um, the study that was published in 2013, showing that overall there were no real differences in outcomes, but in the cohort of severely calcified lesions, subset of that cohort, uh, there did appear to be greater strategy success and less chance of having to then bail out to rotoblader with a balloon-based strategy alone. And similar results were seen with the Prepare Calc study that was published a couple of years ago, showing that angiosculpt-based technology versus rotational atherectomy, there was more strategy success with the rotational atherectomy. But the other way of looking at this is that a modified balloon was successful in 80% of time. So four out of five cases, the modified balloon was successful, and then they had to cross over for the remaining parts of that. In terms of technique with rotoblader, I think um, there is some convergence on trying to go lower speed so as to potentially reduce the risk of slow flow and, and potential safety as well. This is just a study, um, low versus high speed, 100 patients, showing really no difference in outcomes as a whole. And I think many operators have sort of adopted the slower rate of speed. And then if that doesn't work, then going up to higher rates of speed overall. Now, what about other devices, other atherectomy devices? The Diamondback 360 from CSI is also approved here in the United States and abroad. It's basically an electrical-based system with an eccentric crown um, that sort of ablates straight as well as going from side to side uh, with some forces against the wall in that way. Um, it also has a, a mode that has a lower speed uh, system such as glide assist that allows you to get through the vessel. It's a little bit slower than the Dynaglide that you get with Rotoblader. Now the outcomes um, were actually studied in the Orbit 2 trial that demonstrated low rates of adverse outcomes as a whole. Most Much of it was derived from paraprocedural MIs that occurred um, largely due to um, detection of biomarkers and then outcomes out to uh, two years are demonstrated on the right of this slide. Again, the majority of this was sort of paraprocedural events and then some later events uh, overall. Now, in terms of technique, though, um, there's always a concern with all types of devices about things like perforations and the like, and this applies to both CSI and Rotoblader. But it also turns out that with more experience, and this is data that was presented last year from uh, Mount Sinai, Miami, which is the Columbia affiliate, showing that with good experience, you can actually really lower the rate of complications. So for instance, if you see a very tortuous vessel with a lot of wire bias, no matter what atherectomy device you put down, that's a complication waiting to happen. 
but an experienced operator can recognize that and they would never do atherectomy in that situation. And so that type of training, that type of learning can allow low rates of complications as a whole. And that's an important facet of atherectomy and the ability to determine when it's safe, when it probably shouldn't be used. Now, in terms of relative advantages of orbital and rotational atherectomy, um, there, there are um, advantages and disadvantages to each. So for orbital atherectomy, generally speaking, it's more compatible with six French systems, including guide extensions as well. Um, there is typically less hemodynamic instability noted with it, um, and this glide assist feature can be quite useful as well. On the other hand, rotational atherectomy will um, actually make channels in even the most uncrossable lesions sometimes. Um, it also uh, can be used for more severe angulation and bias, particularly with a 125 burr. Um, and then there are other scenarios as well um, where you need to uh, have um, have uh, larger and larger burrs. So overall, my take on this is not to say that one is better than the other. It's that East can, either can be used in most cases of severe calcification, and the idea is to become facile at both so as to know when one is advantageous versus the other, versus other technologies such as NC balloons alone, balloons like the OPN balloon, and then lithotripsy as well. I will point out that we're running a large randomized trial looking at a balloon-based strategy versus an atherectomy-based strategy. Uh, this is called the Eclipse trial. Um, this is looking at a primary endpoint not only of uh, target vessel failure, but also there's an imaging substudy in about 500 patients with OCT to look at minimal stent areas. The idea here is to show for once and for all that there might be a technology uh, or not that is more beneficial than another because we just don't have these comparative studies. We know that there are a lot of things out there and that's great, we like more tools in our box, um, but overall it's important to try to identify what the best strategies are for specifically specific calcified lesions and that's what we aim to do with the Eclipse trial as a whole. So with that, I've taken you through a variety of technologies. Some conclusions and some basic points that, that I'd like to make are that number one, coronary calcification is becoming more and more prevalent in the modern day cath lab and CHIP era. This is because of aging populations, more comorbidities for patients, and what we call downstream presentations, where more patients who are stable are managed with medical therapy. And so when the time comes for them to come to the cath lab, they typically have more complex anatomy and many times more stabilized plaques that lead to more calcification. Calcified lesions are among the highest risk lesions we treat. They cause short-term pain, suffering, and risk during the procedures. And they're also associated with worse long-term outcomes, as I showed you before, restenosis and stent thrombosis. Now, imaging is a must. Um, and my statement on this is that if you don't image, you don't know what you're dealing with. So number one, you could not diagnose calcium. And number two, you would potentially misdiagnose the type of calcium. So for instance, if you see a severely calcified lesion and you're thinking, oh, I need to do atherectomy or I need to use IBL, well, maybe the calcium is eccentric and a normal NC balloon is gonna work just as well. Maybe the calcium is nodular and then you need to think about doing atherectomy. And maybe it's deep wall calcium, but concentric and there's an easy way to deliver the device and IVL would be better. And so I think this decision-making based upon the imaging is what we're really looking to in the future to be able to dictate not only treatment algorithm, but then also before we put the stent in to ensure that we have a fracture and then finally to optimize stents and make sure there's no residual dissections or the like. Finally, I'll conclude with the statement of the field of adjunctive therapies for these calcified lesions is heating up with more and more data emerging soon. And as I mentioned, the shockwave data has been presented. The Eclipse trial is um, over uh, two thirds enrolled. Um, there are other devices that are potentially on the horizon as well. And so this is an area of hot and, and, uh, and, and keen interest. And as a result, we definitely have to keep our eyes on the future for it. Thanks again for listening. It's really great to be part of this meeting. And again, I wish you all the best and can't wait to see each other in person again. Okay, and uh, let's move on to your last talk. And uh, I will uh, introduce the Dr. Kubo the, from uh, Wakayama University and I make it perfect how to use the invasive imaging in complex PCI. Dr. Kubo, please. Today's my talk is about uh, um, making it perfect how to use invasive imaging in complex PCI. And this is my disclosure. And uh, so if I'm talking about uh, a lesion preparation, the main major target is severe calcified lesion. So intravascular imaging, IBC and OCT can identify severe calcification. In IBIS, calcium is characterized by high 
echo on the surface of the calcium, they commonly having a shadow. So iris cannot assess and measure the calcium thickness in the area. On the other hand, the OCT and uh, calcium is characterized by low echoic area with sharp border. There's no signal shadow, so OCT can measure the calcium thickness in the area accurately. If and uh, the calcium is thick, we will use a low tabulator to like me. The left panel show the iris. The iris have an artifact after low tablator atelectomy called reverberation. The OCT, as shown in the light panel, OCT can provide a clear image of the cutting surface of a currently vessel wall without artifact. If the calcium thickness is thin, then we will use the balloon. This, in this case, we use the cutting balloon. Uh, as shown in the left panel, and before PCI, OCT image, and OCT demonstrated circumferential thick calcium. And uh, uh, after cutting balloon angioplasty, OCT clearly visualized the calcium fracture at 2 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 11 o'clock, according to the blade. And then uh, stent implantation, and uh, the stent was uh, well expanded because the fracture site was expanded well. So uh, we have a data, uh, we, uh, we uh, analyze our uh, clinical uh, laser data. Uh, the stent expansion is associated with the calcium fracture. The minimum stent area and a stent expansion index were significantly greater in the group with calcium fracture compared with a group without calcium fracture. Uh, in addition, the listenosis and target lesion revascularization rate at 10 months follow-up were significantly lower in the group with calcium fracture uh, compared with a group without calcium fracture. And we measure the thickness of the calcium, uh, uh, calcium at the fracture site. The median was 450 micron ranging from 110 micron to 770 micron. As shown in the light panel, ROC carb, and uh, calcium plate thickness of less than 505 micron was the corresponding color value for predicting calcium fracture by high pressure ballooning. The calcium in the bifurcation region especially opposite to the side branch osteum, is a uh, risk for the uh, side branch occlusion after main branch stenting. The stent does not expand toward harder calcification, but toward the softer carina, causing carina shift and a side branch osteal occlusion. This is a case with a bifurcation lesion between aerodial and diagonal branch, as shown in the left panel, OCT before, pre -interven uh, before intervention demonstrated severe calcification in the bifurcation lesion. Uh, after stent implantation in the main vessel, the stent was well expanded in the main vessel, but the uh, side branch ostium was blocked. Also, this is also the uh, case with the bifurcation lesion between the radian and diagonal branch. OCT before intervention demonstrated very thick and a severe and circumferential calcium in the bifurcation, bifurcation site. So we used the low tablet atelectomy. Low tablet atelectomy removed the calcium in the bifurcation lesion. And we used the cutting balloon, a cutting balloon maker fracture of the calcification as shown in the mid panel, uh, the 11 o'clock and the five o'clock. And then we implant the stand. Stent was well expanded, and, all, and in addition, the side of the branch ostium was not occluded. The calcium nodule, uh, calcium calcium nodule, calcium, uh, calcified nodule, is also a challenging case for the PCI. 
uh, IMERS and OCT uh, uh, clearly identify the cause by nodule as a protein mass from the uh, best of all. The vascular response after stent implantation is uh, different uh, in classified nodule uh, from aplaglavture and the erosion, as shown in this slide. Uh, this slide shows the data about the post PCI stent expansion index. The post stent expansion index uh, was significantly smaller. Uh, in the classified nodule compared to the plaque rupture in the lodging. So, uh, uh, atelectomy uh, may be, uh, may be uh, effective for the PCI to the classified nodule. This slide shows the lotobrite atelectomy as shown in the left panel before intervention. Angiography demonstrated the fitting defect in the mid RCA, and an OCT demonstrated the classified nodule. After lot of later telectomy, and nodule disappeared uh, in the in the region. And in this case, the laser telectomy was used in the proximal RCA. Angiography demonstrated the fitting uh, hedgeness and the fitting defect, and uh, OCT demonstrated uh, Aluka a uh, laser eczema laser colony angioplasty and uh, altered underlying lesion morphology of the calcified nodule, and then. Stent implantation, stent was well expanded. And this is an orbital atelectomy. And the, uh, before intervention, OCT demonstrated calcium plate at two o'clock and a calcified nodule at seven o'clock. And a low speed at, uh, orbital atelectomy uh, altered mainly calcium plate at two o'clock. And a high speed orbital atelectomy altered calcium nodule at seven o'clock. And the arteriosclerosis and calcified nerve tumor is also very, very challenging case for the uh, PCI. And in this case, their instant listeners was observed in the proximal LED and OCT and IBS demonstrated a circumferential calcification within the nerve in tumor. Uh, in, and in this case, also have a circumferential calcification within nerve tumor uh, within the stent. So uh, you, uh, the uh, lotobrator directly was used. And most of the calcification within the nerve tumor was removed. And after stent implantation within the stent uh, is effective, stent was well expanded and the calcium was fractured at uh, uh, six to seven o'clock. So summary, intravascular imaging guidance have a great impact on the PCI strategies in severe calcified regions. Detailed evaluation of coronary atelectomy uh, artery calcification by intravascular imaging and nervous prediction of stent expansion, evaluation of lotability effect, risk assessment of bifurcation side branch occlusion, and diagnosis of calcified nodule and calcified neurotima. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kubo. And I will open a uh, free discussion with the panelists. So we focus for today uh, how to deal with the preparation before stenting. So how to investigate the region morphology and uh, uh, how to do the preparations, especially for the focus for the calcified region mm. for stenting because of the uh, stent expand due to with uh, how how was the uh, calcified plaque. So. Any comment or uh, discussion for this uh, focus for the preparation? Dr. Wu? Dr. Kim has uh, raised his hand. Maybe he can give the first question, Kim. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question to the Dr. Kubo. Thank you for your presentation. So is uh, I, uh, as, uh, as I think as you, I prefer the uh, OCT guidance when I uh, face on the calcified lesion. So, so uh, how can you decide it to whether this lesion is the prefer, you prefer this NC balloon to, uh, to uh, prepare the lesion preparation mm -hmm. or is the uh, which uh, lesion is do you prefer is the rotational arterectomy is the assessed by OCT? So, so what is different uh, 
is the decision making whether is NC balloon or rotational atherectomy mm -hmm. by OCT. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. I'm very happy to have a question from you, specialist mm -hmm. of the intervascular imaging. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, uh, we analyzed our data and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and the uh, cutoff value was 500 micron mm -hmm. uh, to predict a calcium fracture by ballooning. So mm -hmm. if the calcium thickness is more than 500, we will use a ballooning. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, less than less than 500, we will use a ballooning, and more than 500, uh, we will use a low double rate atherectomy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, so, so it's a short, short question: is that is, uh, is, is there any influence? The, is the circumferential calcium or just a localized calcium? There is no uh, uh, difference. Yeah, yes, completely different. Uh, you are right. And a very nice question, important question. And um, the uh, severe classification, we generally call the severe classified uh, lesion uh, with uh, other, uh, in cross sectional image, more than 270 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this time, uh, we measure the calcium thickness and we determine the PCI strategy. Thank you. I think we have a lot of experts, uh, rotational astrectomy either, or maybe orbital astrectomy from uh, Japan, Kachman, and also the Goose and also. What is the threshold for you guys uh, to, uh, to do a, a select which kind of uh, uh, modified lesion uh, uh, device? Because uh, imaging, I think, is routine in Japan, but in, uh, in the real world practice, maybe not as that, uh, Medicare recover, uh, recover, uh, coverage. So, so sometimes we are only by angel. Uh, so it's a threshold of uh, selecting uh, debarking device. Uh, uh, in question to Sandoso and also Kashima. Because then the IBR is not available in Japan now. Japan, yeah. So, of, uh, yes, of course, I want to use the IBR, however, not. So, uh, because I all are uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe in the differential sounding mechanism. I think in the developing a device is uh, uh, needed a uh, uh, safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I don't find in the uh, any physical law about uh, the uh, differential sounding on the physical law. So I always use the root rate. Tegu, Tegu. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> I think uh, we have heard a uh, uh, very good uh, lecture from uh, Ajil. Uh, yeah. And uh, I just want to uh, compliment uh, his recommendations. We know that there are plenty of algorithm how to treat uh, calcified lesions. And usually if lesion is severe, we can also use uh, the uh, calcium scoring system using uh, OCT, uh, mm -hmm. as mentioned by uh, Ajay. Mm -hmm. There is also another calcium scoring system uh, using IVOS. I don't want to elaborate this uh, much in detail, but if the lesion is severe, if the lesion is balanced uncrossable, then usually uh, debulking is uh, recommended. And these are either rotational atherectomy mm -hmm. or orbital atherectomy. Mm -hmm. In my hospital, I use both. But, mm -hmm. but in all algorithm, there are two conditions which are uh, not uh, so well explained. Mm -hmm. And number one is, uh, calcification associated with instant stenosis. Mm -hmm. This uh, also presented by Dr. Kubo, yeah. of our case, mm -hmm. among others, and also Ajay. And mm -hmm. this is a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. The calcium mm -hmm. may be located outside the stem. Mm -hmm. This is a condition uh, predisposing to instant stenosis, mm -hmm. but also inside the, the lumen. And this is probably caused by uh, neoarthral sclerosis, among others. And this is a very difficult situation mm -hmm. because if we do a, a rota or, mm -hmm. uh, or orbital atherectomy, these are off-label indications. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will explain how to do this with rota and uh, OAS in my practice. Mm -hmm. So usually the recommendation is to, do, uh, uh, to use IVL. Mm -hmm. so now we can uh, further expand the, the stand. Mm -hmm. But in my hospital, it is off-label indications. Mm -hmm. We can use uh, rota. We use, normally mm -hmm. use either rota or mm -hmm. orbital atherectomy. 
How to use this? And this is very important because if we don't uh, use it carefully, uh, mm. the, the device may uh, may uh, interact mm. with the struts. Mm. And with burr, for example, you may get burr stall. Uh, mm. same, mm. thing with, same thing with uh, uh, orbital atherectomy. You mm. may even uh, have a facial uh, evolution. Because of uh, you know uh, the bird or the diamond bag is attached mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, fractured uh, the mm -hmm. damaged stand. So mm -hmm. in order to avoid this, in my practice for rota, I normally use high speed mm -hmm. because with high speed 190, for example, mm -hmm. the bird tends to be very stable in the middle, mm -hmm. not like uh, low speed. However, uh, in the if, if I use uh, orbital atherectomy, we have to use uh, high speed. Uh, no, low speed. Mm -hmm. With low speed, the bird will spin uh, in a, in a uh, smaller orbit, not not in a big arm. Big, big orbit. And that is uh, for that. And another situation which is uh, not mentioned in all algorithms is a calcification associated with STEMI associated with heavy calcification. In this kind of situation, not only a rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy, but also IVL is contraindicated because uh, IVL may uh, disrupt uh, uh, the, the, the thrombus and cause a distal embolization. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, James, I think you have a three device in US. So what is your recommendation, uh, how to use and uh, your imaging uh, strategy, James? We primarily use IBIS, although we, also have OCT available. I think, um, although they're complementary systems, I think, you know, one platform that you get familiarity with, um, I, I think is sufficient, so long as you use some imaging. Um, I think that each has its own strengths and, and features, but I think uh, expertise in at least one imaging is really critical. Okay, so any other questions from Uncle? Um, uh, okay, the Chang, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Wu. Can I have a question for James? Um, in your case too, uh, you, did you use uh, uh, intravascular lipid chipsy for a patient with uh, upper standing when you find the stand is not uh, expanding well, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes. um, so what's the experience of using the uh, IBL in patient after standing when you find the stand is not expanding well? Are there any concern using that? I think there's a concern if you if you do it. Um acutely mm -hmm. and will that interfere with i think it's unknown will it interfere with the drug or or the polymer um so in that case that i showed it was i think six weeks later the patient was brought back for the ivl um, but it is a in my opinion it is a very effective bailout technique for when a scent is clearly under expanded mm -hmm. uh, the example i showed was an unacceptable result and, and then came to us for IVL and it was uh, very successful. So um, I think it's a good tool and I think it has advantages over um, what Dr. Santoso was talking about using either rotational or orbital atherectomy in stent. I think there is some, some theoretical um, appeal to using IVL mm -hmm. uh, for such situations. But the device, uh, you know, the profile for the IVL, it seems if you don't have a space, probably you would uh, unable to pass and you were not able to, to deliver. That's true. Time. Sometimes, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a little higher profile than an NC balloon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it does deliver sometimes when you don't think, but you're right, sometimes it won't pass. And that's, mm. that was the third example I showed where you had to, you had to first do atherectomy just to get the IVL in. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to use them together. So, so it is a limitation. Mm -hmm. um, you might have to do something first to get it to cross. Any, any other questions from from Thailand or from uh, yes. Vietnam? Yep. Uh, I have a question for, for all of you about the, the imaging. Because we have the criteria to do the adjunctive device for the heavy calcification, we have the optimization criteria for the calcium, for the, for the stent and the imaging, but we don't know how to stop if you 
do more than this is you have the catastrophic result. I, I asked Dr. Kubo, my sensei, for a long time <laughs> because now today I have to train the fellow and the fellow always, hey, it's not acceptable result. You have still have the limitation expansion. Mm-hmm. So you have to do more and sometimes mm-hmm. but then rupture or something. Mm-hmm. There's a rupture happen. Do you have any tips and tricks to see mm-hmm. this is the limitation? Mm-hmm. You have to stop and accept this result? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Suboptimal. Yeah. So it's a cool. minimum have... area, yeah. How much you were satisfied? Yeah. <laughs> you, Danny, is that, is that the Kubo? Question for you. <laughs> So actually, the uh, uh, endpoint criteria in CBO classification is not established, mm-hmm. and uh, but uh, generally the stent expand, uh, stent minimum stent area mm-hmm. uh, in IVERS uh, might be more than five point five, and uh, in OCT uh, four or four point five, mm-hmm. and uh, stent expansion is weakly associated with uh, uh, future. Uh, I, uh, in future target region revascularization, but the uh, uh, optimal stent expansion index might be uh, more than 80%, but uh, mm-hmm. approximately half of the cases uh, might be uh, less than 80% in the severe classified region. Mm-hmm. So region preparation is very important before mm-hmm. stent implantation. Yeah, I think I just want to underline this, that, that uh, we need to get a, a good uh, volume uh, or well, sufficient volume reduction. I mean, usually after rota or after orbital atrectomy, we see smooth uh, concave uh, uh, polished surface of the calcium, and that is number one. And number two, we need to get enough fractures because uh, without these two uh, precondition, we would not be able to get our stand well implanted. So this is a prerequisite for a good step plan uh, platform before we embark on implanting our stand. Yeah. Uh, okay, so all, all of you talking about the uh, preparation, but uh, time is almost <laughs> enough. <laughs> and I think uh, the preparation is very important, especially for the calcified region. And uh, of course, the working is at first. The second one is the cracking, how to make it a cracking. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, this is a, uh, uh, if you make uh, enough cracking, so introduce uh, the good well stand expansion for the after all. So any, anyhow, so this uh, issue is a very, very important uh, mm-hmm. point of view. So please uh, keep in touch and uh, discuss in the future. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so there everybody. Okay. So maybe next time we can see face to face. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. And uh, see you Bye. next time. Bye. 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 Bye.